The Organ and the Organist. Nicholas Kiniston gives the third in a series of five programmes in which British organists talk about organs and discuss two of their favourite instruments. The programme opens with Nicholas Kiniston playing the Leipziger Gig by Mozart. the Mozart jig on a modern German instrument. It's undoubtedly a beautiful organ and I will be returning to it later. But if you were to ask me if it was my favourite organ, well, that I would find quite impossible to say. May I try and explain why? At one time I played the French horn. If you asked a horn player about his favourite instrument, he would probably say, my own. If he went on to press him for reasons, he might reply that, though he realised his instrument was probably not the best in the world, it was the one he had chosen after much thought. And because he had owned it and cared for it for some time, he had become used to its foibles and could make the most of its beauties. In other words, it's personal to him. Organs, of course, are not personal in that sense. They are made for buildings and the player has to adjust himself as best he can to the instrument. Every organ I play is completely different, sometimes good, sometimes bad, and often mediocre. There are times, I have to admit, when I regret having abandoned my French horn. So, perhaps rather than try and specify a favourite organ, it is simpler for me to try and evaluate what goes to make a good one. Firstly then, however complicated the organ may appear from the outside, it is never more or less than a lot of pipes, like tin whistles, placed over a box filled with air, the air being allowed to blow the pipe when you press a key. It is, in fact, a keyboard wind instrument capable of making glorious music. If I seem to be stating the obvious, it is because the organ, unique among instruments, attracts a certain following whose interest is technical and primary non-musical. Particularly in the organs of 30 or 40 years ago, the interior mechanism was often more reminiscent of a telephone exchange than of anything musical, and it was this complexity that proved a fatal fascination to many people who would never have given a Stradivarius a second look. In most of us, this fascination of the mechanism develops into an appreciation of the musical purpose which it serves. There are some, however, for whom it remains an end in itself, and it is unfortunate that these people, knowledgeable as they may be, often succeed in becoming actively involved in organ design. Because they are not musicians, their views are usually restrictive, and the organs they design lack humanity, becoming mechanical monsters. Their avid study of the many historic treaties on the instrument is often of little help 
since the musical implications are only half understood and the conclusions they reach are doctrinaire. Obviously, historical research is vital, but it must be related to musical practicality and not be allowed to become an end in itself. Bach would certainly be amused to see some of the expensive mistakes perpetrated recently in this country in the cause of historical accuracy, but he would not, I think, be amused by the waste of money. Perhaps at this point we can return to the organ with which I began the program. It is situated in the parish church of Eppingen in southern Germany. The organ was designed by a Benedictine monk called Father Hohn, who is also a very capable musician. It was built by Kleis of Bonn, it has two manuals, 35 stops, and it has totally mechanical action. It will adapt to any music you care to perform on it. I would like to play you the smaller of the two Mozart fantasies, Kirchhoff 594, which I recorded on this instrument.
The Mozart fantasy, Kirchhoff 594, which I played on the small but versatile instrument in the parish church of Eppingen. My own attitude to organ building is entirely unequivocal and is based on practical experience. I feel really strongly that if the organ is to continue to be taken seriously by performers and composers, then it must be allowed to develop as a modern instrument in its own right, and I regard the building of antiquarian reproductions as artistically unsatisfying and unproductive as making reproduction furniture or executive pseudo-Georgian houses. Let me make it clear immediately that I love the old organs and over the last months have played on instruments dating from the 16th century to the present day. But organs copied from previous centuries never have the sweetness of tone of the originals. I am not suggesting for one moment that the study of these instruments has not helped to develop the best in modern organ building. But I do think it is an odd situation when there are some instruments being built now on which one cannot satisfactorily play the music of one's own century, let alone the last. What sort of inspiration will these instruments provide for the composers of tomorrow? And if composers aren't interested, the instrument will suffer decline as has happened before. Edward Elgar, in his day, was inspired by the old hill organ in Worcester Cathedral. Indeed, he wrote his sonata in G with this instrument in mind. Unhappily, however, the organ no longer exists, so I chose to record the sonata on the new Kleiss organ in Ingolstadt Munster. Here, then, is the first movement.
the first movement of the Elgar Sonata in G, which I recorded on the four-manual Kleist organ in Ingolstadt, Munster. There have been two periods in history when the organ has suffered a severe decline of interest among composers. The first was with the invention of the piano, when every composer was far too busy writing for the new instrument to bother with the old. Happily, Mendelssohn arrived and created a new upsurge of interest among composers. The more recent decline was more serious because it was the fault of organ builders themselves. With the advent of electricity, they found that by replacing the traditional mechanical link between key and pipe with electric cable, they could place the pipes at a greater distance from the player than ever before, either to suit the whim of architects or to achieve spatial effects. This produced some ludicrous results, since you cannot really play musically by remote control. The other use they found for electricity was for blowing the wind, and this was certainly a genuine advance, but it was misused to produce higher and higher wind pressure, culminating in the enormously powerful and ponderous tone color that characterizes so many instruments built in this country in the period between the wars. Because the tone of these instruments sacrificed everything to loudness, the separate voices did not blend, and an organ without blend, and that shouts rather than sings, cannot be said to be musical. So, once again, the organ lost credibility among musicians, and in England we had to wait until the 1950s for the first glimmers of a renaissance, and in this instance, the voice crying in the wilderness was that of Rafe Downs. The achievements of Rafe Downs can't be overestimated. He is without doubt one of the greatest living scholars of organ music, and his design work reflects the vast experience of international organ building assimilated during his years as a travelling recitalist. His designs, especially that for the organ in the Royal Festival Hall, in which he set out to produce an eclectic instrument capable of the performance of music of all periods, acted as the catalyst that completely changed the insular and complacent attitude of the British organ scene in the 1950s. When one remembers the absolute furore that was unleashed with the opening of the Festival Hall organ in 1954, it is interesting to note that the organ Mr Downs designed for Buckfast Abbey in Devonshire was conceived as early as 1939. Although the scheme for Buckfast is not as comprehensive as that for the Festival Hall, it well illustrates Mr. Downes's philosophy of eclectic design. For the technically minded, it has four manuals and 71 stops distributed over six sections, and it was built by J.W. Walker and Sons. From a record I made on this instrument, I should like to play the second fantasy of Jean Alain. The second fantasy of Jean Alain, the brother, incidentally, of Marie-Claire Alain. I recorded it on the Walker organ in Buckfast Abbey. The repertoire of the organ is enormously rich and varied, including, as it does, compositions as different as those of, say, Frescobaldi and Messiaen. It is this great variety of styles which causes the modern organ builder his problems. 
for, in trying to recreate too exactly the instrument of one era, he has to sacrifice the music of another. The Germans built many of these over-specialized instruments during the period of their so-called Orgelbewegung, the organ reform movement. But they are now adopting a more liberal attitude and many of their new instruments are shining examples of the all-purpose organ. The organ of Ingolstadt Munster, which you heard earlier, in my opinion, is the most successful example to date of this type. It has four manuals, 69 stops, 10 couplers, and the action is all mechanical except for the couplers. Two of the manual departments are enclosed. It certainly can produce some most exciting sounds. I recorded my final choice on this organ. It is the last movement from Symphony Number no. 6 by Louis Vienne. <laughs> Nicholas Kiniston playing the final movement from Louis Vian's Symphony No. 6. And it ends this programme, the third in a series entitled The Organ and the Organist. Next week, the organist will be Simon Preston. <laughs>